I'm, I'm sorry. Whoa. Thanks, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to, uh, to interrupt you. I mean, it's been, it's been such a stimulating day that uh, it's, uh, it's hard to control this much energy in a room, and I, and I do apologize for that. Uh, what we want to do is to want to begin very quickly f with Senator Hagel. He's, he, has to, he has to catch a train at 1 o'clock. We out of here by one o'clock. So we, we we want to take advantage. You know, if 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 when we get going here and you can quietly slip up and get some food, go ahead and do that. But we want to get going with this with this program if we can. Uh, let, and first of all, let me just say uh, a big thank you to all of you for coming. We're we're delighted to have you here. This is part of a series that we've started to say how does a, how does America start thinking its way through complex problems rather than just using muscle. You know and uh, a lot of it stimulated from an early conversation that I had with Senator Hagel when he was in the Senate, and no one spoke more thoughtfully or forcefully during his time in the Congress than did, than did Senator Hagel saying America needs to find its way back to a thoughtful foreign policy. And uh, it was uh, that stewardship during his time in the Senate that we drew on and asked if he would be a part of the commission, and he agreed to do that. Somehow, during his schedule, his very full schedule, he also became an author and produced a fine book that outlined what America should be and needs to be doing going forward. I suspect we're going to build on that today. I would like to especially say a word of thanks to you, Senator Hagel, for coming. I know the demands on your time, and it's just terrific to have you here. So let's go ahead and begin, and let me introduce to you and welcome to the stage Senator Chuck Hagel. Thank you. John, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, please continue to uh, uh, gobble, eat, uh, drink, uh, uh, take a nap, whatever, uh, whatever works uh, for you. It, it particularly uh, is not an irritant or will not be a, a bothersome development because uh, I had my eyes dilated this morning, and I have no idea who in the hell I'm talking to. I don't know if there's even anyone there. I, but... Uh, not any different from how it used to be in the Senate. It, uh, nobody ever listened then either, but uh, occasionally they'd show up. So uh, go right ahead. I know you've got a uh, tight schedule that you need to adhere to. Uh, first, let me uh, thank John, of course, and CSIS and uh, the two joining organizations that uh, have uh, participated uh, here today and uh, over the last few weeks in putting this uh, important day uh, together and for your efforts and your leadership and your substance, uh, uh, thank you. We are all uh, better for uh, your efforts. I uh, also want to acknowledge my uh, partners uh, on the commission who you heard from uh, this morning, uh, some of them, not all of them. Uh, you, of course, uh, I suspect know uh, each of them and know of their good work or certainly you know of their reputation, but you had an opportunity. Uh, this morning to hear from them and to uh, understand more fully uh, why uh, they are uh, and have been and continue to be such important contributors uh, to this big topic that you are exploring uh, today. And I also want to thank John again for allowing me to participate uh, uh, in the commission because I, uh, uh, this morning, before the had my eyes dilated, uh, uh, worked my way briskly through the document, which you uh, have all seen, I suppose. I suppose. And um, I, I don't know of a document that I've seen recently in the last few years that more comprehensively uh, identifies solutions and approaches and elements of a strategy that uh, can be used to frame the challenges that face mankind, and I say mankind because every challenge today in the world is a global challenge, uh, and also drive us toward uh, some high ground of how do you fix the problem? What do you do about it? Uh, there's no question that we live today uh, in a world that is more complicated, more combustible, 
more interconnected, more dangerous than probably uh, ever before. Now, I haven't lived uh, through all those years, uh, but uh, I occasionally read. I know that's foreign for a member of Congress, but um, I occasionally do that, and I listen to a lot of people who know something about these issues. And uh, we are at that time, and we are at a time in uh, the history of man that probably represents the most transformational, uh, most uh, redefinitional time ever. And that redefinition and that reorientation and that transformation that is occurring in the world today is occurring at a rate unprecedented. We, we've never seen anything quite like this, and you need not go much beyond the global financial crisis to see what's happening. Uh, and that financial crisis once again reminds us that every challenge is global. Uh, every corner of the earth is dealing with this issue. Uh, pandemic health threats. Uh, last week, uh, our news has been consumed with swine flu. How far it goes, how deep it goes, uh, we don't know. Another good example of the interconnectedness of the world and that all six and a half billion people on the face of the earth now truly live in a global community, a global community underpinned by a global economy. So what you're exploring today um, are the realities uh, of all of that, um, and you are delving deeper down into uh, the societal dynamics that, that, always, uh, that always dictate and always drive outcomes in politics, in government, uh, in every facet uh, of our lives. Politics, as we know, the process we use uh, to uh, work through differences, to elect leaders, to make decisions, uh, hopefully with some consensus, uh, that then governs. And that's what the process of politics is about. Politics just reflects society. Politics never leads society. It doesn't lead anything. It reflects. It responds. Leaders react. They respond. Occasionally in the history of the world, there's a confluence of events and dynamics that come together, and then true leadership matters. FDR, Eisenhower, Lincoln. Uh, there are times in the history of man where the right leader is critical. Most times, and they come, uh, these development defining times come about twice every 100 years. The last time we saw such a time, I think, was right after World War II when we essentially built a new world order. We, we built a new world order right after World War II. And that 10 year period that was responsible for that. And that world order held pretty well for 60 years. But like all institutions, uh, uh, all facets of a society, whether it's governing uh, uh, or business or education, uh, they become obsolete if they do not remain relevant to the challenges. They become irrelevant. Every institution that was built after World War II, what I refer to as coalitions of common interest, they were built based on one simple premise, common interest. They were built on the basis of we would define our relationships, define the future of the world, define a world order not based on the differences that we had with each other, but based on the common interest that we had with each other. United Nations, NATO, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is now WTO, Bretton Woods brought IMF, World Bank, uh, dozens of multilateral banks, development institutions were born, were built in that 10-year period. And it was all about common interests. And if we don't have a platform, a structure, to work from to deal with differences, then there will be conflict and chaos. And we are seeing that in certain parts of the world today. And when you identify those certain parts of the world today, and we have two leaders in town today meeting with President Obama from, in my opinion, the most dangerous region in the world, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, they represent areas that were left behind, most of the Middle East. They were left behind, did not benefit from the great strides of mankind in the last 60 years, did not benefit from those coalitions of common interest, those structures 
of common interest. Uh, you can go beyond those areas, much of Latin America, much of Africa. Uh, the troubled areas of the world today were the areas that we didn't pay attention to were left behind. No individual freedoms, uh, no hope, people chained to cycles of despair. Uh, so it's, it's actually pretty predictable uh, what, what's going to occur. Yesterday I was at American University and um, uh, kicked off a day-long seminar on Eisenhower and the Eisenhower era. And what struck me, and I uh, confessed in uh, 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 the spirit of, uh, of self-interest and uh, narrow parochialism, uh, I uh, have been an uh, admirer of Dwight David Eisenhower for, for many, many years. And I have always believed that he was one of the greatest presidents we ever had. And one of the reasons I believe that is because what did not happen what did not happen in his eight years, when a lot of bad things could have happened, but because of his leadership, he averted it. And um, over the years, uh, many have categorized the Eisenhower years as kind of a boring. Well, I think most of us would take boring uh, today. Uh, they were not boring. And, and, and when, when you bear down into those eight years and what actually was accomplished, it was astounding astounding what was accomplished during those, those years. And the, and the reason I bring Eisenhower up and what happened in American University is because it, it cuts right to what you're talking about today. Many of you know this, but it was Eisenhower in 1957 uh, who assembled a group of presidents of universities. And as many of you know, he was president of Columbia for a short period of time. His brother uh, was uh, uh, also a, a d distinguished educator, president of university. And he brought these university presidents together, uh, all uh, in this region and others. And in particular, one uh, president at the time, the president of American University, uh, after listening to Eisenhower and the reason that Eisenhower brought him together, and the reason he brought him together was to challenge American education on what are we doing about educating our young people, preparing our young people, the next generation of leaders, about international affairs, about uh, knowledge and education, understanding the differences out there, religious differences, ethnic differences, cultural, history, regional. Because if we are all going to live on the face of the earth and share resources and try to accommodate and respect each other as best we can without going to war constantly and a, and a constant turmoil and chaos and conflict, then we need to prepare our people. And we need to talk about what separates us. Because only then, in understanding the depth of that, which is very much what the Smart Power Commission's charge was, and identifying that, and then what do you do? What does a great power, like the United States, do with all of its great power uh, to move towards some resolution and bring the world with us in some consensus? We can't do it alone. There's no issue out there that we can deal with alone. We're certainly finding that out in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Great powers uh, have limits to their power. Uh, what's going on and has been going on in Darfur, uh, some of these areas of the world that in many ways we're not exactly powerless, but, but we have very limited ability to control some of these things. What does that lead us to? One of the issues, uh, and I think one of the first issues the Commission report points out, is alliances. This was what Eisenhower talked about as much as any one thing, forming alliances. This is what coalitions of common interest are about. We're going to have differences. And alliances are absolutely critical for all the reasons uh, we know. And I, b I believe the Commission report starts out with, with, that, uh, with that section. Well, yesterday's meeting, bringing together uh, many universities and scholars and practitioners of uh, foreign policy, which is, is really the, the framework, it's the large arc that represents uh, our interests. Because within that arc of foreign policy fits all of our national interests, trade, security, 
relationships, environment, energy, world health issues. There is nothing that is not in that framework, that inventory uh, of challenges. And so that great arc called foreign policy represents it all, just as I think the Commission report points out. Uh, Eisenhower understood that very, very well. And he understood it earlier than most anybody in this country. And he drove this country and alliances to start focusing on that. Hence, as a result of that meeting at the White House in 1957, the first international school, international affairs school, was set up. And it was American University who started the first School of International Affairs in 1957. Georgetown, uh, where I now have the uh, privilege of teaching one class uh, per semester and doing some uh, lecturing, even though uh, one of my brothers, my brother Tom, who's a, a legitimate professor, um, law school professor at the University of Dayton, he believes that I've set back American education by generations. But uh, he's uh, two years younger, always uh, has lived with uh, this envy. Uh, I've had uh, uh, he, he, but he's making progress, and we're, and I'll give him your regards. And uh, but it it was it was that framework that that first uh, put in place a formalized awareness of the importance of alliances, of foreign policy, and then as you work your way down into the depths of that as this morning you did with the panelists that you had, and you will continue to do that today. Uh, you start exploring in some detail, well, what are the instruments that a great power has to deal w with these, uh, these global challenges and these global issues that threaten not only the United States but threaten us all? Uh, well, we have many. Uh, force is certainly one. But again, as we found out in Iraq, and Afghanistan, and uh, we had an 11-year uh, difficult period in Vietnam, which we found out the same, that force alone can't do it. Why should that be surprising to anyone? It shouldn't be. The history of man is full of examples uh, of occupation armies, of invasions, uh, of cultures, and in the end, the occupiers, the invaders, the conquerors always lose. They always lose. So what's the point? The point is you, we must get down deeper into the fabric of a society and understand that as well as we can, hence the entire portfolio of instruments of power, force, development, uh, aid, assistance, diplomacy, intelligence, alliances, trade, uh, all of those are instruments of power. How you harness those, uh, how, how you cogently bring all of those instruments together toward a purpose, toward uh, a policy that is implemented and framed and shaped uh, to achieve a purpose. Not just ricocheting from crisis to crisis, but actually try to shape a policy that has a purpose a purpose of some at least medium-term, but certainly long-term sustainability. And we all, all human beings around the world, are really not very different. Now, I haven't been to every, every corner of the earth. I've not been to every country on earth. I've been to many. I've been to well over 100 countries. Uh, many of you have been to far more. And I'm not an expert on any of these countries or any of these issues. But I have observed this. Uh, I don't think there's a great deal of difference between Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, on the fundamental dynamic of how they feel about their families. Now, there are differences in rights, women's rights. But there, too, let, let's not forget the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Half the people in this room 95 years ago could not vote. Half of, the, um, half of this room couldn't vote. You were disenfranchised 95 years ago. 
in fact, unless you were a white male when this uh, great republic was formed, um, you, you really were not imbued with all of the rights stated in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights. In the mid-1960s, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, uh, we need to, needed to adjust then. Uh, if we had not had those adjustments and those self-corrections, and that's the wonderful thing about our country among many things and a democracy, is that we have a process to self-correct. Uh, if we had not had those debates and those laws, uh, there's probably very little question of whether the current occupant of the White House would be there today. So my point is we, we've got to frame all this up with, with some reality that, that we just didn't stroll onto the democratic field 250 years ago as this remarkable republic uh, that gave everybody rights. Uh, we struggled with it. We identified the problems. We worked hard. A lot of people sacrificed everything to make a better world. And isn't that really the essence of what we're talking about? Isn't that the essence of the differences of people when we go through these differences of religion or region or ethnicity or history? Uh, it is all about making a better world because in the end that's all that matters. You don't buy someone's loyalty. You can for a while. In, in Iraq during the so-called surge, we put 125,000 Sunni on our payroll. Uh, this is the so-called awakening group. These, are, these were young Sunnis unemployed. So we paid them about 300 to $500 a month not to kill us. Well, uh, that helped. But does anybody here think that's a long-term fix? Because now they're going off our payroll. Most of them are off our payroll. So where is that loyalty uh, going to be? And we armed them. And I don't think anybody in this room who knows anything about Iraq would say that things are better between the Sunnis and Shias today than they were two years ago. They're probably worse. So I, I use that as an example until you get down into the depth of the humanity of, of each of these issues, you'll never solve the problem. Now, you can put a fix on it for a while. And one thing we know for sure, uh, we, we'll never have enough troops to put everywhere. I was with a, with a former four-star general uh, Friday night at a speech I gave uh, down at the VMI uh, for the opening, the dedication of the George Marshall um, Leadership and Ethics uh, uh, Conference building. And uh, this is a general uh, who, uh, among other positions he's held, uh, he was also uh, a commander of Central Command. And he said to me, you could put another 100,000 troops in Afghanistan along that border, and they would be absorbed so quickly because that isn't, first of all, that's not the way you're going to fix that problem, but it's just the, the, the dynamic of the mass problem, the, the terrain, the geography, the people, the issues. And so, yes, force is part of it, is part of it. But uh, we have got to do a far better job uh, with uh, identifying, developing, framing, shaping, and then implementing uh, these soft power forces within our policies. Now, it's, it's not easy. It's imperfect. You make mistakes. Uh, you get ahead uh, a couple of steps, and you get knocked down again. You go to the side for a while. But in the end, that societal dynamic, the, the fabric of a country and the people, is the only thing that ever, ever will change anything. And so uh, until we recognize, and I think uh, uh, President Obama does recognize this, and I've had long conversations with him, and I think his senior people, I think Secretary of State uh, Clinton understands this. I know Joe Biden does. Joe is a very good friend. Uh, uh, our Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates. Bob Gates has been giving speeches the last year and a half. He sounds like a Secretary of State. He's talking about why we need more soft power. And you can't just keep giving the Pentagon more money and building up their programs and taking away the aid programs and the diplomatic programs and the assistance programs and the development programs from the State Department or from USAID. 
you can't do that. And here's the Secretary of Defense understands that as well as anybody. There isn't a general, by the way, out there that I've ever met who doesn't understand that. And if for no other reason, then they understand how we have overloaded our circuits using force. I mean, we've done great damage uh, to our Pentagon and to our people. And when you when you got these young men and women who are on their six tours, many of these young men and women on their six tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq, those tours go to four tours. They're longer than the entire length of World War II. And you, you can't run your people like that. It, 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 there'll be a breakdown. So consequently, like there are always consequences, and what you always have to be f most fearful of are the unintended consequences. They, they come, even with the best policy and the best leadership. You still get unintended consequences. Some of the consequences that we can identify now, for example, suicide rates, record high, divorce rates, record high, and so on and so on. So it, it isn't a matter of a luxury of trying to figure out a better way to do this as uh, these issues are dealt with in this smart power commission which you're dealing with today. It isn't a luxury or an option. It's a necessity. We don't have any choice. Or, or we will see the world in, in constant chaos, constant chaos. And it will, the problem will get so big, there is nothing really we can do about it. If for no other reason than the numbers are so incredibly large. I remember, and many of you do, that it was re reported in the newspaper, that um, Secretary Rumsfeld once wrote a memo, which as you know he was very famous for those uh, reference snowflakes. And the memo uh, to his generals and to those in charge of policy in Iraq and Afghanistan was very simple. They wrote, are we creating more terrorists than we're killing? That's a pretty good question. Well, the answer to that is yes. I mean, we know that today. We, we can answer the Secretary's question surely today. And, and why? Because our purpose was misguided? Uh, uh, no, but, but, but your purpose cannot be framed in a one-dimensional dynamic of divine mission. Uh, there, is, there is no such thing in governments as divine mission. A divine mission of we're going to bring democracy to the world, whether they like it or not. And by God, they're going to like it. We'll send our troops in to show them about democracy. Uh, divine mission should be left to missionaries and, and uh, not a government. That's again why Eisenhower understood this far, far sooner than anyone did. Alliances, first part of the Smart Power Commission report. And then as it goes down through all of these different uh, facets. Well, um, I uh, have uh, informed you of nothing profound. Um, I am incapable of that, but uh, uh, I think every now and then it, it uh, is useful to inventory these things and, and state them uh, in a way that uh, they can be seen and used as very practical, functioning parts uh, of policy. And uh, I, I believe, and I, I believe this not only because of the current leadership, uh, of this country, but I believe it also as I watch young people and listen to young people and observe young people. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. Now, they're not ready to take over the country. If you ask my son, he'd say yes, but um, my daughter is more thoughtful about it. And um, uh, I watch these young people, and I've stayed close to young people all my life, 12 years in the Senate. I never went back to Nebraska without putting uh, some kind of an event on with a school. And I was in Nebraska a lot over 12 years. I always went to a grade school, high school, college, technical school to stay connected. Listen, uh, didn't give a speech. We just go around the room and talk about whatever they want to talk about. Uh, this next generation is, is, uh, is going to be a pretty special group uh, of young people. And we must uh, prepare them like every generation must prepare the next generation. In many ways, I think we've not done a very good job of that. Um, none of us are perfect, but um, 
I don't know. There's just something instinctive about this next generation uh, that I see and I feel. And I'm, and I'm uh, uh, as a father and a citizen, a former uh, policymaker in this country, a veteran, um, I, I feel pretty good about, about the future with all the problems we have. And I feel as good about it, yes, these young people, uh, I think the current leadership gets this. But um, we have a system uh, that allows us uh, to shift and to change, and as I said, self-correct. And um, uh, we also have a nation that um, has an, an astounding amount of just good common sense. And I think that's a reflection and probably the most significant strength of this country. That, that we are this this quilt that has been uh, that has been uh, knitted and crocheted and whatever you 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 like to do in that business uh, together with all these variations of color and background and history and creed and traditions and religions and and somehow that has brought a tolerance uh, and uh, an intuitive respect. I mean, we've had our problems, and we, we've made mistakes, and it hasn't always been exactly that way. And it won't be exactly perfect. But th that's the strength of this country. And um, I think reflected in the Smart Power Commission report is much of that. Because in the end, as I conclude, in the end, uh, every community in the world, every region in the world is basically the same, is basically the same. And uh, uh, we must strive to knit all of those samenesses and, as Eisenhower said, those common interests together and build a, a world fabric. And I'm not talking about a world government, so the blue helicopter crowd, the blue helmets and all that, I mean, the black helicopters. I'm not talking about that. Uh, there will be, should be, needs to be sovereign nations responding in their own interests. But there's also got to be something bigger. It's just like each individual in this room. You wouldn't be here. You would not be here. You wouldn't be involved in the things you're involved in, this issue in particular, if this was all about, in your own mind, your own self-interest. Of course, we all and each have a self-interest. And there's nothing wrong with that. We better all have a self-interest. But it's something bigger than a self-interest. And that's what drives a great society, and that's what has sustained our society. And I think that's what you're getting at as much as any one thing. Then you work through the specifics of how you do that and all those instruments of power uh, that I talked to about, uh, that you apply them. You, you bring them together in a strategic way that uh, then structures a, a strategy. And it always has to be regional. I think that's one of the big mistakes we've made over the years, that we've tried to take a rock in some kind of an isolation in a vacuum tube, and Iran uh, over here, and then we'll do a little of this over here, and then maybe some of this the Israeli-Palestinian issue over here. No, no, it is all knitted together. It needs to be approached from a regional dynamic. There'll be no peace in Afghanistan or Pakistan without the Iranians involved some way and the Indians on the other border. Not because I say it, that's just the reality of it. That's the reality of it. I will conclude with this. Engagement is important. Uh, uh, I think we are entering uh, an era of engagement and cooperation, accommodation. And accommodation is not necessarily a bad word. Certain things you cannot accommodate. You can't accommodate killers. You can't accommodate terrorists. But you must accommodate country's national interests and their own optics and their ideas, uh, or, or we will never accommodate any possibility uh, to bring a better world, a safer world, if, if we don't do that. I think we, we, we are opening that new uh, era. Engagement is not appeasement. Engagement is not appeasement. And the more of us uh, who believe that and uh, understand that, uh, then I think uh, that will not only reflect our future policies in this country, uh, but it will anchor our policies uh, with a purpose. Thank you. Be glad to respond to questions. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Senator. We have about um, now. You can see um, why John Hamry insisted that he be part of our Smart Power Commission and why he's so missed in the Senate. Uh, we have time. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Once again, please identify yourself, name, and affiliation, and we'll start in the back over there. My name is Nihal Gunawardena. Uh, Senator, I, uh, you're a much admired policymaker, and I don't want you to be uh, misinformed. The oldest school for foreign relations in the United States was formed in 1933 by Harvard University and Tufts at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Well, um, if, if I have bad information, I uh, apologize to Harvard and Tufts. Um, but um, uh, I was told and I read um, uh, that uh, the 1957 School of International uh, Affairs was the first school devoted to that one issue uh, at American University. So uh, if I have bad information, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stand corrected uh, and I will go back to American University and ask him what the hell the deal is. <laughs> Sherry Mueller, a graduate of both Fletcher and American University. Uh, well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, we'll talk later. But, Senator, um, many of us in this room are involved in trying to help the U.S. Congress understand the value of programs like the International Visitor Program of the U.S. Department of State, the Fulbright Program, and other exchanges of all kinds. Um, now that you've left the Senate, what advice do you have for us to make cogent arguments to your former colleagues? Thanks so much. Well, thank you for all of what you do and the organizations, institutions represented here uh, in that effort. And I am uh, well aware of those efforts over the years, and I've tried to support your efforts in every way I could over the years. Um, your point's a very important point. Um, and, and how you do that, I think, is first keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but what really makes a big difference is um, is, is having uh, as wide a base in 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 this country uh, of individuals representing districts and states. So when they come to Washington, and it, it's the it's the same approach everybody takes on every issue, um, a congressman or a senator sits down and listens to respected members of his or her state and district. And that helps, first of all, it helps you get in, it helps you make your case, and it helps educate the member of Congress on the importance of these programs. And um, education, information, as we all know, uh, is essentially the essence of anything, because you must be informed, you must be somewhat conversant, educated on issues. And if you're not, uh, then uh, most likely you're, you're going to drift or uh, eventually go right over the cliff and make the wrong decision. So there's no magic to this. You all know that out there. You work hard at it. You just keep coming back. Uh, but, but widen your base uh, as much as you can uh, because that, that really uh, affects members of Congress. As I said earlier in my remarks, just remember, politics reflects society, that members of Congress react, they respond. Um, rarely are we in situations where they can lead. Congress wasn't set up to lead. I mean, it really wasn't. I mean, when you, when you really read the Federalist Papers and, and most of the dynamics of what Congress was about, what was the responsibility of Congress, a senator, a congressman, both houses, as you know, have totally different responsibilities. Um, and, and so we, 535 members of the Congress, I mean, we, we all think we should, we should be president, of course, but, uh, or at least Secretary of State or something, but um, you can't do that. Now, I know that some of my former colleagues think they, they can and will continue, and we're all, always going to have that. But uh, the best I think you can hope from in the Congress on these kinds of things is an educated Congress, is an informed Congress, and then through the committee structures and through decision making, uh, they come to the right con conclusions. But, but uh, presidents must lead on this. And then all the attendant organizations out there that are critical to, to uh, a democracy, uh, 
and I and, and my sense is uh, your organizations represented here today are going to be more critical, more relevant to the future of this country and policy making than ever, ever before. And, and, and if for no other reason I say that is because the President, his team, members of Congress are inundated every second of every day with a crisis, with an immediate problem. And you are whipsawed and ricocheted and the time that you have to think, there is no time. Now, I've said often over the years that I would like to see a president rather than uh, uh, go to every county fair and go everywhere and just run around uh, every second of every day. Uh, I'd like to see a president actually take three or four hours to sit alone in the, in the Oval Office or wherever he wants to sit and just stare out the window and actually think. Uh, now, uh, and, and by the way, I don't mean to be critical of, uh, of any one president or any, their, their jobs are huge, huge jobs. But unless we slow it down enough for our leaders to think a little bit, and that's why these organizations are going to be so important, because the Smart Power Commission, does anybody really believe the Defense Department or State Department would have had the capability, first of all, to draw on the talent? I mean, I was the weak link in it, but, but the, I mean, you look at the talent that was in that on that commission, the experience on that commission, and you heard from some of them this morning. The State Department can't do that. Uh, the Defense Department, not because they don't have smart people over there, but because every day is consumed every second with something. Now, you can have internal reviews and so on and so on, but to actually produce a document like that, it has to come from the outside, and you want it to come from the outside. You, that's one of the reasons it's so important. You draw upon the kinds of experiences represented by those commissioners. And CSIS and these organizations here, uh, other organizations, I'm chairman of the Atlantic Council, uh, Brookings, all these organizations do tremendously good work, uh, as, as well as other institutions represented here. But you will be more important than you've ever been. Thank you, Senator, Senator, for the great presentation. Dr. Mabry, I'm the uh, director of MITRE, Cor Mitre Corporation's uh, initiative in corporate, and, and pardon me, in smart power. My question is actually about your comments about uh, uh, Secretary Gates and, uh, of course, the uh, State Department. I was, uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the Defense Science Board studies on both strategic, strategic communication and, hu and human dynamics, which actually recommended exactly what you just said. Uh, and by the way, one other comment, um, I just flew down from Boston, and it's w wonderful to hear the comments about the Fletcher School. Um, it's clear, clear that we... I thought we, we cleared that up. <laughs> uh, it's clear that the government, as you just said, can't do it. Uh, the Defense Science Board recommended the creation of a Center for Global Engagement. It was wonderful to hear you use the word engagement. I wonder if you could comment about um, either that particular proposal and or um, what expectation you have that Congress would actually take some action. Um, and interestingly, just a, a footnote, um, in our study, one of the interesting things we heard was not the government saying, which we're hearing now from our leadership, we can't necessarily do it. We actually heard from the NGOs and a number of other independent international organizations, we want to work with you, but we can't necessarily work directly with the U.S. government, which is one of the motivations of the proposal. So I'm interested in your, your thoughts on that. Well, that, that's an important uh, point, and uh, it's a very relevant part of uh, the, the overall scheme here and the scope of what uh, we're all trying to do and what the government's going to be dealing with and continue to deal with on, on trying to, uh, to find ways to, to get these documents and this perspective and this information and understanding down to where it needs to, to go and then work it into the larger scope of, a, of, of policy. Um, as I said, and you know this, um, this process, any process is imperfect. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to have a certain amount of trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, you always have personalities in things. Uh, you, you've always got uh, the, the personality of, of leadership, the personality of a president's team, the personality of a national security advisor, a secretary of state, a secretary of defense. Each of those personalities uh, have their own individual thoughts about where something should go. They don't necessarily always agree. The president is the president, but still uh, uh, he uh, uh, does not pick I don't think, I hope this never occurs, uh, weak people. Uh, he picks strong people. 
and strong people have strong opinions, and so that's a factor that is also part of, of uh, all this. Um, uh, the Specific issues that you bring up that the NGOs uh, raise uh, are also part of the imperfection of, of the process. You just have to uh, uh, work it through. But but I come down to this is the, is the real answer to your uh, question. Uh, there is there is no substitute for leadership. Things just don't happen. Uh, as I started my comments this morning about Eisenhower those eight years. A lot of things could have happened. The Suez Canal crisis in 1956. If Eisenhower would have sided with the French and the British and not drawn the line, we'd see a whole different situation today. Uh, and some of these other kinds of things. That's leadership. And um, when we get into these areas you're talking about, leadership has to be very clear, purposeful, and bring a consensus together uh, to, to activate uh, all, all the resources that you need to bring in NGOs and different groups uh, into the thinking of, of narrowing and channeling what you want to produce. Too often in Washington, too often I think in any institution, it's nobody's fault, it's just the way it, it is, that we drift, uh, we get off track. And in my opinion, uh, if there is one principal dominating factor, uh, that uh, was most responsible for this global financial crisis is that all of us weren't paying attention. We were drifting. And you can take Wall Street greed, you can take sloppy regulators, you can take the Congress not paying attention, take a whole bunch of things, and all that's part of it. But, but when, when, when leadership drifts, when institutions drift, for example, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, some of us saw that coming years ago. I introduced a bill in 2001 warning that there was systemic risk with what they were doing. And the reason, as much as any, any other reason that I said that, is because Fannie and Freddie had so drifted from the original charter. Fannie and Freddie are both congressionally chartered institutions. Their charter is very clear why we set them up, why the Congress, why the government, why the people of this country set up Fannie and Freddie Mac. There's a very clear charter in mission. They were way over here from that charter. Now, I'm not an expert on any of this, but as I, and I was on the banking committee, it was a senior member, uh, chairman of, uh, of the Securities Oversight Subcommittee. Uh, so I paid a little attention to this. It wasn't that I was any smarter than anybody else. Um, I, I watched that the, as far as what factors into my own thinking on these things. So you could take that Fannie Freddie example and apply it to everything. Derivatives, subprime mortgages that were wrapped and rewrapped and rewrapped, selling them. People didn't even know what they were buying. The ratings agencies were saying they were AAA, many of them. The ratings agencies were on the payroll of the institutions they were rating because they were, they were getting millions of dollars in consulting fees. Now, as we look at the, through the rearview mirror and say, my God, well, of course. That's my point. We, we, we just all got sloppy, and we let things just drift. Consequently, what happens always happens. Uh, there was a major implosion. And so uh, I know you may think that's a little uh, abstract an answer from where you're, you were with your sp more specific question, but not really. I mean, it's leadership. And you've got to have, leadership has to pay attention. It's any organization, and many of you run organizations. You have to pay attention every day to your budget, to your people, to your mission, to your contributors, to your stakeholders. You, you've got to watch every day. Uh, are, are you moving in the direction that you're supposed to be moving in? And that's, that's, that's the answer. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. I've worked for the Fulbright Program in a number of international education projects. I'd like your advice in terms of a very sticky issue. We're encouraging international students coming here. We're encouraging exchanges. But in an economic downturn, people are frightened for holding on to their jobs. They see outsiders as threats. 
how can we turn this around and encourage these exchanges and not see this as a zero-sum game? Well, uh, again, you have uh, brought up a very uh, poignant issue and a very, very uh, legitimate uh, question, which we're dealing with, everybody is every day. I think the answer to that is, and first, I don't believe there's any simple, easy, quick answer. But here would be my answer. Everything you are doing, everything everyone in this room has been doing, associations that you have, why you're here today, is addressing this issue. What does that mean? That means the entire arc of internationalism, globalism. Now, it's imperfect. It's like trade. You know, trade is not a guarantee. Trade is an opportunity. There are winners and losers in trade. There's a great law that I don't know if it's ever been written down, and I don't think it's in any constitution, but it's been around since man has been around, I, I assume. I wasn't there, but I assume. Uh, it's called the law of comparative advantage. And you never beat that law. That law governs everything in life. So textiles, automobiles, well, my grandfather worked in textile mills. My dad did. Well, shouldn't I? I mean, the birthright. Well, go back and read little Arnold Toynbee, or just a little bit of history. There's no birthright of uh, jobs. The world moves along. It moves ahead. And you want the world to move ahead because as the world moves ahead, as standards of living rise, comes with that more stability, more security, more investment, more opportunities, better futures. Now, there, there are raggedy parts to that, I, I know. But um, so we've got to make the link, to answer your question, with this the internationalism of what's good for our country overall. We can't just pick and choose. If, if we're going to be the leader of the world, if, if we are going to do the things that I think most Americans want our country to do and, and be who we are, you can't then just decide to pick and choose which standards and laws and regulations you're, you're going to live by. I mean, the torture memos, the Geneva Convention was a good example of that. Well, we signed all these, and we kind of led the world in this, and we put ourselves up on a higher plateau of standard of conduct. But, you know, these terrorists, you, you know, they're animals, and you, you so what if you waterboard them and torture them? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. America, you're... you're proclaiming one standard here, but then based on your own interpretation and your own rationalization logic, then you're adhering to a whole different standard. You, you can't have that. And so what we've got to do is get underneath all of this so that we can project to the people of this country an understanding that this is good for all of us, what's going on here. Uh, the interchange, the engagement. We want people investing in this country. I mean, I can give you I, I can give you hundreds of pages of documents and information which you already have about how much investment comes into this country. If we start locking that out by shutting out students from China, I mean, I mean you know how much uh, of our national debt the Chinese own. Now, if the Chinese decide that they're not going to buy our securities anymore, and they're about two-thirds of their $2 trillion in foreign reserves uh, uh, are holdings, are U.S. securities. Now, if the Chinese decide that isn't a very good investment, if you remember the President of China made things go wobbly a couple of months ago by saying, I'm not sure we're getting our return, uh, what would happen is that the, the ability for us, the United States, to make payments monthly on the interest, not on the principal, but the interest of our national debt, I don't know where you get the money. And you take then not only China, but many countries of Asia, uh, who also hold a lot of our securities. Uh, that's just but one example to use to people say, you, you, can't, you can't close the doors like that because investments in plants. Uh, I, some of my colleagues from the South who, who have tinges of protectionism uh, wrapped around them and, uh, and, and maybe not as enlightened as some might want, both Democrats and Republicans, by the way, uh, I remind them occasionally, how many foreign automobile plants are in Alabama? Now, if, if the Japanese had not put those plants in there, uh, tens of thousands of Alabamans who, who have good jobs and those cars are being sold, pension plans, futures, they wouldn't be there. 
they wouldn't be there. So I think we, we have to make those kinds of uh, arguments. I know it's difficult, and, and because, unfortunately, um, in politics, there and this is never going to change, but um, we um, often find ourselves playing to the lowest political common denominator for the moment. And we've got all these bright people like uh, Rush Limbaugh and Lou Dobbs and others who, who truly educate and inform and elucidate. Uh, 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 but, you know, there was, a, there was a political party, many of you know, in this country in the 1840s, and they called themselves the Know-Nothings. And they were very proud of that. Uh, of course, it didn't last very long, but uh, they had a hell of a lot of fun, I suppose, when, with it. But uh, they were actually proud of that. Uh, and they were anti-immigrant, they were anti, and I, I'm not sure how many of them thought that they were real Americans, by the way, in 1840. I used to kid my friend, former senator from Colorado, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, uh, that, that Ben probably was the only real American in the Senate, but I said, even you, Ben, I mean, your people had to come down through the Aleutian Islands, so I'm not, I'm not sure we can say you're real uh, American either, but, uh, but, but it's those kinds of things, and you're, you're always going to be dealing with a, those, those facets, uh, uh, and we just have to rise above it, make a better argument, be more cogent, uh, and, uh, and, and win the day. And certainly the facts are on our side. Thank you very much.